So from location to size to whether they are close to the border or they have a major airport, each city thinks about tourism a little differently. Toronto, Kingston and Sudbury each have their own distinct draw to visitors from near and far. Over the next 40 minutes, we'll look at the, the challenges these regions have faced amid the pandemic and hear what's next for these three cities. So this panel is moderated by Sean Newman. The panelists are Meredith Armstrong from the city of Greater Sudbury, Pat Tobin at the city of Toronto, and I think we're just about to be joined too by Megan Knott from Tourism Kingston. So uh, again, uh, please put your questions or thoughts to the panelists in the Q&A, and I will try and get to all of those after the session wraps up. So on that note, I'm going to pass it over to you, Sean. Thanks, uh, Megan. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, and thank you to Ontario Culture Days and to everyone watching. Uh, we're, we're really excited about what's been going on the last uh, day. And um, I'd like to thank you uh, to the panelists who are, are now appearing. Um, we've got uh, Megan Knott from Tourism Kingston, Meredith Armstrong from Sudbury, and Pat Tobin from Toronto. Um, so as Megan described this panel, one of the things that we're kind of hoping that this panel will offer is a kind of a snapshot of what's happening in these jurisdictions. Um, and because they each have unique needs and infrastructures and, and different relationships between tourism and arts and culture. And, you know, as we've been hearing across the panels and presentations yesterday and today, the pandemic has had tremendous negative impact. Um, but at the same time, it's creating opportunities to rethink our, some of our processes and partnerships and how we work across sectors and with different communities. Um, so we will be taking some questions at the end um, of the panel, so please put them in the chat as they come to you. Um, and so I think we'll just uh, dive in. Um, you know, each of you have very interesting things going on uh, and strategies for addressing, you know, the, the, our current um, context and existence. So let's just start with hearing about some of the unique hurdles that you're seeing in your regions. Uh, and how your teams are addressing them and possibly, you know, are they innovating through them? And um, just to start us off, I'd like to put you on the spot, uh, Meredith, and just ask you to, to jump in. Uh, and Megan and Pat, please, you know, uh, jump in yourselves when it makes sense. Uh, thanks, Sean. I was wondering how you were going to do that. So I'm happy to kick things off. Uh, really pleased to be here as part of this panel. Um, so up in Greater Sudbury, we have a vibrant arts and culture scene, and I'm sure folks are aware of that in, in multiple languages. And so I think that um, we have always worked to foster good relationships between the arts and culture organizations. I work for the municipality. We have the role, as I believe Pat does, as both a grantor and a supporter, but also really we take it very seriously to be a matchmaker fostering capacity in those organizations themselves. So um, I think that has um, put us in a good position to um, ensure that that network of contacts is working together um, to look for opportunities to innovate. So we saw things like um, lots of online performances, both uh, with, with purchase tickets and for free, uh, with benefits on both sides of that, um, we really saw a lot of social media use. So even um, for an organization that produces something that's live or music based, you know, we saw lots of Instagram and lots of conversations with audiences, uh, building that relationship, um, making sure that loyalty and support is there. Um, and as things slowly start to creep towards recovery, I think we're also seeing um, kind of modified performances outside. Um, you know, are there things that we can do in, in unique venues that allow these groups to ensure the social distancing, those kinds of things. So, you know, I think it's a lot of little things adding up to uh, real resilience for our organizations. That's great. Uh, Pat, Megan, what, what are you all up to? Go ahead, Pat. Okay, thanks, Megan. Um, so thanks, Sean, and uh, thanks a lot to Culture Days for the invitation and uh, happy to be here. Um, in terms of the question you posed about innovation, and as Meredith said, I think that the circumstances forced innovation on people and within the cultural sector brought out the best and created the conditions to, to experiment at the same time as you know people are effectively going to be experimenting in their return to the public realm. So creators are having to meet audience in new places and new ways. And so that's been phenomenal. The role, uh, you know, Meredith is right. We are both a grantor and a presenter at the city of Toronto. 
and a producer. So we've had to sort of think this equation through uh, from various angles. Um, for As a presenter, delivering events like Nuit Blanche, our model has been as many people in one place as you can get uh, to create truly electrifying moments and allow people to rediscover their city differently. Our innovation challenge is that's not what the conditions will allow anytime soon. Uh, and so how do you invert that model and put 25 people on street corners at 200 sites across the city rather than 1 million people downtown in one place? So it's forcing innovation. And I think the culture sector and municipalities are, are rising to the challenge. Uh, I think uh, I think there's more innovation that's gonna be needed as we probably move, you know, paradoxically as we reopen and things appear to be going very well. We will also be seeing the period where the really significant federal and provincial supports into the culture sector and other places for, for individual culture workers as well, begin to necessarily be retreat. And the harder part is probably ahead of us in terms of uh, the liquidity crisis and the long-term viability uh, of organizations. So again, a, another but different challenge for how we all innovate uh, to bring audience and creator together in ways that are financially sustainable. Yeah, and I, I'd like to come back to that 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 piece around um, like what's kind of what we we'll needed in the future. But um, Megan, uh, what what what's going on in your region right now? Yeah, sure, thank you. So uh, in Kingston, a lot of what we did, uh, unbeknownst to anyone, obviously uh, with COVID nineteen entering into our uh, lives, was the fact that. Um, back in about 2016, we started to really develop uh, the culture of the place in terms of talking through tourism. So tourism uh, was less so in Kingston about identity of traditional pillars like sport tourism or attraction tourism. But really what we started to do was embrace uh, our colleagues uh, within the cultural sectors in Kingston to really articulate the fact that uh, place make branding or or what we are about is really uh, the makers we call the makers um, the makers of Kingston and so if you uh, are able to kind of take a look at the things that uh, tourism Kingston or visit Kingston have done it's really uh, more so to the fact that we're talking about um, the uniqueness and the culture and the vibrancy of the place through these folks that make it so special and a lot of the times it's the independent owners and it's the traditional and non-traditional artisans uh, that we feature and work with uh, and in meaningful uh, ways. And so I think um, how that gratefully positioned us uh, in our current climate uh, really was uh, sort of uh, by happenstance, uh, you know, a, a really good thing because what we did was we were able to still curate content and curate things in the tourism sector that traditionally we probably wouldn't have thought of if we hadn't done all this legwork ahead of time. And we started to talk about things like inviting people into your home um, together at home is, is actually what we called the campaign throughout the pandemic um, to be able to look at the culture of the place within uh, the inside walls of what a maker artisan or, or a person who, um, you know, is doing something really fabulous within our community that we want to share to a larger audience. And so I would just say that, um, you know, from a Kingston perspective, uh, culture is really infused in the brand. It's not one or the other, it's combined. Uh, and it was a real combined uh, effort to get there, but we're, we're finally sort of here. And, and Megan, you had done um, a lot of consultation with, with artists and whatnot leading up to the development of that initiative, correct? Correct. It started out as sort of branding exercise um, in a, a traditional marketing sense. But what we really did, uh, to your point, Sean, is when we started to meet with a lot of uh, folks within the community across all uh, sectors, is that we started to do more consultation than we initially thought that we would do. And out of all of that consultation came the ability to um, create sort of a, a curated content that was, an, in fact, uh, an infused maker's map. So it tells you, as opposed to that traditional, you've got to come to our uh, city for 48 hours and hit these 10 spots. We're actually saying, come to Kingston and uh, really get inside the life of an artisan in this way and look at the woodworking skills or look at the sail making crafts and those pieces. That wouldn't have happened without all of this consultation within the cultural sector um, and the city of Kingston, as well as all of our subcultural uh, groups really helped with that, with that um, 
positioning because we certainly wouldn't want to talk about them in that way without getting to know them and being really careful with our language and, and what we what we do. Right. Yeah, that, that's a really great point that, you know, in many other facets of work, right, we, you know, we, we try to work and, and uh, sort of the center of the voices of people and their experiences instead of trying to create systems that are more handed down to them. Um, so I just, you know, through some of the things that you, you, the three of you have been kind of mentioning, um, you know, it sounds like there are, are lots of great things that are being created. What where do you see possibly pain points that will continue or might continue that that um, even as we start to re, you know recover whatever that looks like or, or re-enter space again? Um, maybe I'll jump in there because I, I you know one of the benefits of these kinds of panels is actually sharing with each other too, and I certainly have been inspired learning about what Megan has been doing in Kingston, and and so it leads to me to think you know we really focused on shop local and support local and we were we were doing really well with an audience that wants to go to that restaurant wants to buy that handmade craft and the the use of social media um, to replace what we were doing in person has provided a perfect platform so i like where you know you've gone with that megan in terms of okay so let's show him stitching the sale close up or whatever i think the pain point is going to be when we broaden again to welcome out of town visitors. And we're gonna do that slowly and thoughtfully, of course. But I think what happens is that person who has that artisan focus probably had to get another job or may not be available to offer um, experiences in person at the same volume or the same level that is possible online or on a social media platform. And so everyone wants to travel Everyone wants to have that special experience, that experiential travel that we all aspire to, but the folks who offer those experiences have had a really tough time making a go of it. And we know this, we know this for sure, because right now, I don't know about everybody else, but if you have a restaurant or a hotel, you're having a hell of a time getting staff and that's frontline. So if you have a specialized skill with a niche product, certainly you've had to make other things work for you. So I think it's going to be supply and demand, frankly, of the experiences. That's going to be something that people are going to have to be patient with. And hopefully there's such a demand. People have now such an awareness of making sourdough bread and, you know, planting gardens that they have a new appreciation for these experiential moments and they want them. And that demand can then build up those entrepreneurs again. But I think we have to make it through probably two years to get to an even keel again, I would say. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in on that to take the pain point. I guess I'd say two things. The second will relate directly to what Meredith says. The first is continuing to bear in mind the scale of the challenge facing the tourism sector and arts and culture as well. So they you back out airlines and those are the number one and two hit sectors. Destination chart. I know there's probably been a lot of doom and gloom. Uh, facts and figures thrown around at the conference thus far. But just really briefly, like Destination Toronto, you know, outlined 8.35 billion lost uh, economic activity due in the visitor economy in Toronto alone from the pandemic through to March 21. So the first year of the pandemic, that's about an 80 percent decline. We've got 70,000 people reliant on the, the visitor economy. It usually generates about 10.3 billion a year. So one, the pain point, it, this is really, really material. And as, as Meredith Hank is intimating, there are two big challenges. One, a gradual return, domestic substitution locally, regional travel, interprovincial travel, international travel, at what level, at what pace, and how do we accelerate will be really, really critical. What we've tried to do, second pain point, uh, is to build a domestic tourism infrastructure at the local level that we never necessarily needed to rely on in Toronto due to very high external visitation. You know, we were up trending towards 30 million a year of visitors in Toronto immediately pre-pandemic. Um, and hopefully we're back there again one day. Uh, however, with the borders closed and to remain thick for a while, we've really got to encourage people to get out and see their city. And so that creates a whole new equation. And you know, you, I'll come to the digital component, but the first is safety and consumer confidence. And so you've got to get you know the protocols right and explained well, and then uh, understood and applied at the individual level, the individual business level. Uh, number two, you've got to shore up the assets. So 
you know, there has been, uh, with respect to destination marketing, in a lot of major cities, including Toronto, a, an over-reliance on large cultural institutions for brand and uh, as your cultural tourism assets. Here, it's a different equation. How do you move people from Malvern to Parkdale and from Leaside uh, to Jamestown? So you've got to shore up the local assets. You've got to work with them on their discoverability. When you are making those investments in, in, in discoverability and digital infrastructure, they've got to be sustainable. So we rolled out uh, something called Shop Here under the Digital Main Street brand, where we allowed a lot of people to onboard in a subsidized manner the Shopify uh, e-com platform, as well as build them a sell-through site. But you know, your offering is only as good as your ability to refresh your site. And, and, and as Meredith is saying too, to maximize your social media connections. So that's that costs money. So we're, we're going to have to stay with these individual uh, artisans, artists, uh, cultural businesses, and small businesses generally, to make sure that the, the offering remains fresh and that we do not simply train the next generation of cultural consumers to look first at Amazon or, or even Etsy, um, but that they look local. And, and you know, and then we also continue to focus in on, on a shop here imperative uh, through our marketing efforts. And that's gonna be a big focus upcoming for, uh, for the city of Toronto, but I'm, you know, we're a bit preoccupied locally about how do you find the funding as we move deeper into recovery to sustain the level of online engagement that'll be necessary to drive revenue to artists and arts uh, businesses going forward. Yeah, Megan. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So we did a few things. Number one, and we discussed this prior to the, the live discussion today, is um, historically Canada 150 a few years ago was probably one of our significantly higher tourism um, years. And that's really because the Discover Your Own Backdoor was significant for Canadians across um, I'd say the entire country and we benefited from that in Kingston for sure. So we've been taking some of those best practices because as the rule book goes for COVID, we'll see domestic travel uh, before we'll see any other travel and we're not dependent on international travel at this time. Um, number two is we've taken time to clean house in terms of what can we do to support um, the cultural services at a time when we can't generally traditionally market as we would or work in film as we would or work in travel trade or all these other sectors that a DMO usually uh, is busy doing. And so what we did was we offered SEO training to all our cultural services, we paid for it. Um, so we elevated the experience of their online presence so that some of these local um, cultural uh, spots, institutions that didn't maybe even have a website, yet alone an SEO conversation going on, a, got, got a website, and B, got some content on there that we could roll up into um, what we call Kingston Association Museums and, and cultural um, historical sites. And so we kind of elevated that experience through that program so that we um, stopped competing for things or had maybe just a phone number for one, but a, a really healthy platform for another. So we try to kind of focus our time on what we could do during pandemic. And I think that's gonna bode well for us during recovery. Thirdly is the municipality worked on a program to actually direct fund um, artists, artisans and cultural uh, uh, programs and sites in our community. Um, and that it was oversubscribed, uh, there's no question, but it was definitely a start in the right direction to locally augment some of the programs out there that maybe those folks um, weren't qualifying for, for whatever reason. So I think those three pieces of what we're, we're, we're sort of looking at right now, um, in terms of a short term uh, plan, but some of these pieces will, uh, I think, guide us really well in the long term. Yeah, um, and I, I, I was just kind of wondering through these things you're talking about, like there's sort of been mention of, you know, like Meredith, you described it as sort of like, um, uh, kind of like re-welcoming people from outside your region back into, uh, and certainly, you know, with like Toronto being a major, uh, and it, like in terms of air travel, as you mentioned, sort of suggested, Pat, like an international, you know, sort of gateway. And with Kingston also being so situated, um, right, kind of the halfway point almost between Toronto and Ottawa, um, there's that, that corridor. Um, I'm just wondering, like, the, where do you see challenges around, um, around that geography, or, or how do you, how do you see that, that, at what, maybe it's more like, what, what do you sort of forecast for where that can start to become another important feature of how you, you, are, you see the sectors working together? 
Well, maybe I'll. <laughs> so um, I think that really for us, Sudbury's always had a high reliance on what we call visiting friends and relatives or VFR. And that's always been the case. We also, we see um, traditionally for our leisure market, you know, end of summer, early fall is, is, a, is a peak time for us because I think Sudbury's an easy getaway for a pretty major market in Southern Ontario, right? We're, we're easily drivable. I think that's gonna really be our focus. So in terms of, um, I think, uh, you know, the way things are going, people are gonna wanna see family first. We haven't seen each other for a long time. So VFR, what are you gonna do when they're here, right? You're, 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 residents as ambassadors has always been important to us. And the things we're talking about, you know, you hopefully have a whole new set of locals who are now ambassadors. We have to go to this cute little place. They do this thing, it's delicious or whatever. So let's build on that, work on VFR as our first wave of visitors. Hopefully that helps us pitch to a home crowd because they're already showing some loyalty. They've got family here. And then as we grow that um, through the work that we've been doing, we also did the shop here stuff. We've done lots of, you know, sessions and seminars. I love the SEO thing. Hopefully we also have a higher capacity in what we call, you know, our experienced providers basically. And so I think that combined, hopefully Ontario becomes its own champion for welcoming when we're ready um, not only globally, you know, visitors coming internationally, but even interprovincially, right? We know folks are going to do that cross Canada trip again and go out east and head out west. But I think in the meantime, let's focus on on our home crowd and and, and that VFR market. And I know we're, we're coming down to time, maybe, but uh, I, I'd add quickly to, you know. Uh, cities are all putting culture at the forefront of the offering for local residents to, to return to public life. And I think that's really critical to keep doing that. Uh, second, I'd say is uh, reimagining opportunities. We're really proud of Cafe TO back, Sean, to your question about innovation. So just carving into the public realm to create both a business opportunity for uh, pretty hard hit hospitality and retail main streets where they're situated, but also it, it's a significant you know, ploy play in tactical urbanism and a significant improvement in the public realm and the vitality of these neighborhoods. So we've got to get more culture. It is very complicated <laughs> being governed by the amount of regs that that, that initiative is, uh, but we are working right now on trying to figure out how we get amplified sound on the patios, which is currently not uh, available uh, per the provincial regs. So I think we got to look at those interesting opportunities and how people are going to have the pent up demand, not just for tourism broadly writ, but to get back and you know get involved in public space as, as you see them owning their parks. And, and that's gonna extend out to public space more broadly. And how do we bring culture into those spaces in a way that uh, that is both safe, but in, incredibly uh, exciting for the populace. Yeah, we're right behind you, Pat, on that. So we are, um, Miranda Shana of Cafe T is Love Kingston Marketplace. So essentially uh, in the core of downtown, we have expanded patios. So we have live paintings happening in the bump outs as you would uh, normally on parking spots. We have, um, you know, a small amount of instrumental music. We pay these musicians to do that. We have stalls in our market square, if you will, that are offered free to local artisans who can sell the types of things that they want or do their craft within that large market space and quite honestly it's just a large cultural experience it's a hub we've created for the past two summers um, that doesn't have you know as i say touch points on that traditional tourism type uh sector uh, notion that we usually work in it's all about pace place-based branding uh you know showing your best uh, in terms of cultural spirit and closing down large main streets to be able to support these local uh, retailers um, you know, and food F and B falls into this oftentimes, sometimes we don't think of that in the traditional sense, but you know, the cocktail makers and the artisans that make great culinary pieces, those are all really important to us. And so we've done things that we never thought we could do, uh, based on regulations, but, um, we, we've made, made, uh, significant improvements in the walkability, the place and the culture of, um, of those experiences for the last two summers, for sure. Yeah, so um, we're going to turn to questions in a few minutes, but just sort of a, as a last one uh, for, for, from, for me, I guess. Um, I'm just, you know, there was, um, you've sort of been talking about, uh, you know, again, the, the limitations that we will be experiencing for a while in terms of tourism uh, from interprovincial or, 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 you know, international. Um, so how do you see, uh, or, or 
what are some ways that you're already or feeling that you different municipalities and regions can actually work together to um, in, in partnership with each other um, uh, in, in ways that maybe haven't happened before? Um, I think this kind of conversation is really a huge part of that, right? Um, uh, you know, best sharing best practices always helps when we have our own stuff we want to advance. It always helps for us to be able to say, hey, here's an example that's working really well somewhere else. So sharing the information is huge. Um, I think it's all about itinerary building. I mean, generally people aren't driving to one place and coming back. They want to make a loop. They want to make a, a route. So things like the Georgian Bay Coastal Route becomes relevant again and, and things like you know, how are you, where are you stopping on the way to where you're going? So I think um, that's why we need to just make sure communication, like the, the conduit is open so that you can say, here's a great place to stop on the way. A rising tide floats all boats. I've been saying that for years and, and it means more now than ever. So I think just awareness of what the product and offering um, is and being, you know, just cheerleaders for each other. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think two quick things. Uh, taking full advantage of large scale initiatives led by the feds of the province in terms of consumer confidence, rapid antigen tests for employees of small business are rolling out right now. That's something we got to look at to equip our cultural sector uh, organizations to, to have as well. Uh, and number two, as if you know, we, as we reopen and we begin to understand public demand for gathering in greater numbers, maybe there's an interesting opportunity. Somebody floated yesterday would, uh, would Toronto want to reach out to uh, other municipalities in Ontario and look at a, a, a provincial or national Nuit Blanche? We're we're totally open to to something. I think Culture Days is uh, is is a great uh, opportunity. And you know September 22, um, you know the, that becomes a pretty interesting window the way things are going. So uh, I I just leave it at that. That I think we should work together on some unified offerings too that make sense uh, to all of us locally. I'd suggest the same thing. I think best practices coming out of this are more regional. We have a regional organization in our um, area that we work with quite closely. Um, and we've been able to weave things in like film, for example, that was kind of Kingston centric uh, ahead of the pandemic. It's now actually regional centric. So our film office is supporting all the sub regional film offices across uh, what we stand to be in regional zone nine, for example. So Belleville all the way to Cornwall. Um, so it's a regional film office now. So it's just those best practices and those learnings. Um, to to your point, Meredith, it's all all boats float if we kind of work together. Uh, so uh, we're gonna take a, a few questions from um, attendees, uh, and you know some of them are like they're picking up, they're listening really intently to what you've been talking about. And so the first question is is um, you know references the Cafe Teal program that, that Pat you you mentioned in Toronto and also the Love Kingston campaigns and just that they've been so successful and really promoted the idea of pedestrian cities. Um, and so, you know, will you continue these initiatives? How do you see them kind of continuing to inform things? Or are they just gonna, are they just a quote unquote, just a stopgap until we can just, you know, resume as previous? Maybe I'll reply really briefly. Uh, with respect to Cafe TO, yeah, two things. It's hard to withdraw something people like once you've given it to them, really pragmatically. And secondly, it's an incredibly healthy exercise for the city. I'm not sure we would have pulled this off under normal circumstances outside of a crisis. There had to be a lot of work and a lot of stripping out superfluous uh, regulation and it tolerating greater levels of risk. So I think we want to use this as a learning exercise for the bureaucracy to be able to deliver that level of innovation more consistently. So hopefully it stays. Yeah, I totally agree. Our Love Kingston Marketplace concept, which is really just um, Cafe Tio in Kingston, 100% uh, true, Pat. Um, the regulations that were before us um, really were uh, stripped down to your point. Uh, to be able to develop this type of thing. And, and quite frankly, actually, we had done uh, an integrated destination strategy. Uh, 2031 is a consulting company that supported us through that. And it actually called for these pieces. We just didn't know how to really effectively make it happen in a short period of time. And then when COVID hit, it just, it brought that particular uh, piece of our strategy right to the front and center. Um, and the municipality was really great to work with. Um, they saw the need and they saw that small business needed uh, the support of those public spaces. 
um, and having things to do in public spaces and supporting business and that just ecosystem kind of came nicely together. So definitely a legacy piece, 100%. Mm. Uh, and uh, Meredith, um, just for, for your context, what, what are, so what's, what's say one, one big initiative that you think might, Sudbury might carry forward? Patios, patios, patios. I mean, I think I feel you, Pat, and it's amazing what the, like, even last year, we were all saying that, like, you know, you think about curbside pickup, people had considered it and thought, okay, it's going to take me three years. And within weeks, um, you know, lots of businesses had it figured out. Our city has really focused on our downtown as a core. It's, you know, one of our key attractions, no matter what your reason for travel and we've worked closely with the BIA, we work closely, you know, economic development where I sit is working closely with roads and, um, you know, infrastructure to say, let's do this fast, let's do it seamlessly. So we set up a, 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 an app, a application review team, we got the health unit on there, we got fire, and, and I think that's something that's not going to go away. And I really like what Pat was saying about the, the urbanism, right? So now suddenly you've got a street with like five different patios on it with twinkly lights and nice, you know, music and, and people laughing and having a good time. Suddenly people want to be there and they're going to miss that if they don't have those patios. So I think outdoor spaces um, and the vibrancy, that's something we want to keep forever and ever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, and I mean, so I'm people not... will, so I was just going to say, sorry. So, you know, people got over the, that was my favorite parking spot very quickly. So, you know, I just, I think we forced some habits changing and cultural shift. And I think that's, that's the part we, now we know we can, and so we shouldn't be held back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I can certainly attest to that. I live in Toronto and I live just North of the Danforth, which is a Greek town. And it's uh, been a huge being able those, you know, sidewalk patios and, and really narrowing of, of the, 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 the vehicular lanes to create increased space. It, it gives an entirely different feel to the neighborhood that would be really missed if it disappeared. Um, so just next question, um, and this is uh, more, more specific for Meredith and Megan, but I'm gonna add a little, I think, to a Toronto component, Pat, because I think it is something that is interesting to talk about in a, in a, in a mega city or you know larger city like Toronto. But so the question is, considering that Sudbury and Kingston are somewhat and quote unquote rural, like outside places like Toronto, um, you know, ha have you been seeing any sort of negative resident sentiment towards increasing visitation during COVID or like, you know, um, environmental, you know, effects or impacts? Uh, and if you have, you know, how, what has the response been? How can you see it being addressed? Um, and Pat, I think I, I just, um, I'm interested in, because in, in Toronto, right, we so rely on city parks. Um, and I would just think it'd be great to hear what, you know, your sort of take on, like, has that, the importance of parks and that, that you know, changed at all? And, and yeah, so. Okay, well, as the furthest away, maybe, um, I think that, yes, there was, um, there have been moments of negative, um, you know, people seeing cars from out of town and tailing them or, you know, I mean, not too many, hopefully, of those kinds of stories, but definitely a concern with out of town visitation. And I would say this is echoed by any of the consumer sentiment data we've saved and seen lately. Everybody wants to travel. Nobody wants anybody coming here. So we're going to have to get over that. What we really did um, is twofold. We worked really closely with our elected officials and with our health unit to make sure we were focusing on local, 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 rediscover, shop local, stay local, and use all of the outdoor assets, winter, summer, spring, fall. You know, we have tons of trails, tons of, tons of parks, use those, their assets. So I think there's a new appreciation of, of trails and, and outdoor spaces. And the other thing was quietly at the same time, reminding everyone, we really need to keep our tourism sector healthy. Our hotels have lost tons of, of dollars from hotel. We're gonna need to be open to out of town visitors to support a key and a crucial part of our economy. We know tourism is not well understood because it's so far reaching and we don't have a widget. So, you know, everyone benefits from tourism. Um, so, you know, that, that political, that advocacy work in the background to remind our, our decision makers, let's not go too far uh, to one side, right? Right now, absolutely be safe, stay safe, do things within the guidelines, but let's not go so far down that road that it, that it becomes hard to come back again. So, you know, there's still some moments, there always will be, but I think we're now sort of pointed in the right direction and we see 
hopefully a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I agree with you, Meredith. Um, so uh, shop local, stay local, staycations, that, that type of language was used last year, this year. We did not do a single thing without vetting it through our local um, public health board. Um, and Dr. Moore now obviously uh, from Kingston uh, is taking on a larger uh, portfolio within Ontario Health. But um, essentially we worked very closely with Dr. Moore and our mayor to make sure that every type of um, content or piece of uh, uh, press that we got was uh, in agreement that all three parties would agree to those um, pieces. Um, and I think to uh, Meredith, to your point, we started out the pandemic with a pretty strong uh, statement to suggest that, and we pulled some data together. So the Conference Board of Canada recognized that Kingston was going to be the fifth hardest hit across uh, all Canadian cities due to the fact of our reliance on tourism. And so we sometimes forget to actually hit people with statistics. I think we talk about this tourism ecosystem is really important and we believe in it. We've drank in the, the Kool-Aid for many years. So we just assume that everyone else knows that. But when you start to talk in economic language like that and suggest that 10% of our uh, workforce is directly related to tourism and you you all of a sudden stop that, you have a huge problem within your community. And so, yes, safety, very paramount, but so is economic, uh, you know, vitality and vibrancy and, and survival. And so balancing those two things, hotels never shut down, right? So, so it was, people were uh, coming. And I'll say too, the, the color zones that we were permitted under in the old, sort of regulation versus the step one, two, three that we're in now, that was very different and very interesting for Kingston because we seem to always be in this really good zone. We were a green zone. We had very low COVID rates. And so even if our messaging wasn't come to Kingston, people still came because they knew they felt sort of safe in our community. So there was lots of things I think to balance within this. Um, and getting ourselves out of it, we have to just be equally as careful uh, in terms of the messaging and language. Yeah, that's great. And Pat, just quickly, because we're, we're about to wrap up. Sure. Um, parks, yeah, for those unfamiliar, Toronto uh, has the luxury of a great park system, like a globally great park system. That's increasingly important in a densifying city. Fully 50% of Torontonians live in apartments. So that number always surprises people, but the, the park is the living room and we have a distributed system. So they're, you know, they're, they're close enough. Um, and you can imagine, you know, the socioeconomic, uh, uh, you know, a pattern of who lives in towers uh, it means that th those parks are critically important for equity uh, issues in public space. Um, we need to uh, ensure that we continue to create the conditions for people to safely use them. We know that outdoor transmission is really low. People want to get involved in parks. Last thing I'd say is I think we have to reimagine them as multi-purpose, not exclusively pastoral and bucolic places, but some hardscaping, putting putting power drops in, putting in the infrastructure necessary for pop-up cultural performance so that we even to reduce the environmental footprint of how we currently mount festivals. But that, that'll be a challenge for us too to meet, I think, the public where they're going to be in terms of their demands on parks. That's great. Thanks so much. And, and so we're, we've got to end it there. Um, there were a couple questions that we couldn't get to, but we're keeping track of them all. Uh, and so thank you to Meredith, Megan, and Pat for joining us. This was really great. And I think as the last panel discussion of the symposium was a nice way to kind of end it. Um, so I'm going to pass it back to Megan from Metcalf um, from Ontario Culture Days. <laughs>